you're up early listening to history. When you get older, you, you are given these kind of tasks to talk about history. <laughs> See what we can do about this. <laughs> okay, I, I have a lot of, of uh, slides to show because this has grown on me when I sort of studied because uh, due to this uh, presentation. And I'm really honored. Thank you, th the organizers. Thank you, Siga, for your very kind uh, introduction. And um, I, will, uh, I will cover from the uh, Nordic uh, society, uh, the NAF, from 1949 to the SSAI in 1999. But I would also go a little beyond that and look into what we see uh, today. And uh, without further ado, as you always say, there are no conflicts of interest. And when I planned for this, uh, this is what I, I thought I should uh, be talking about. First, go back to the very beginning of uh, anesthesia. Uh, and uh, uh, talk a little bit about that fairly quickly. And then in three periods uh, during the 1900 to 1950, 1950 to 2000 and beyond, uh, there was the insensibility of pain for the first um, uh, 50 years. And then the new knowledge uh, sort of came upon us. And that is the end of that period where it was realized that you needed to reorganize, to match the new uh, activities and the modern uh, health care. And then there were three revolutions uh, I would like to, to talk about for the, um, the current time. And I hope we will be able to, uh, you will be able to live through this uh, with me. Uh, the initial steps, uh, 1942, uh, William Clark, uh, and uh, about the same time uh, in March 1842, Crawford Long did give anesthesia uh, for, for dentistry and for the neck surgery for, for uh, Crawford Long. And even Crawford Long, he got a, a little statue in Jefferson um, and uh, uh, honored for that. Uh, but the road to established anesthesia or ether anesthesia took a detour via uh, nitrous oxide discovered by uh, Joseph Priestley. And when uh, Humphrey David, uh, David wrote in 1800 that nitrous oxide could have something to do with the combating of pain. But it, it was Horace Wells who took part in a, uh, in a uh, sort of party where you intoxicated yourself with uh, nitrous oxide. And uh, one of the participants in this frolic party, he uh, hurt his legs and he didn't feel any pain. So we thought there might be something good with that. Horace Wells and William Morton shared a dental practice um, uh, in Connecticut. And Morton was taught about nitrous oxide and ether. And he later moved to Boston and studied the effects of ether uh, on both animals and humans. So that was kind of an investigational approach. And he was then asked to talk about this at the uh, at Bullfinch Amphitheater in 1846, uh, October 16 to be precise, at Mass General. Uh, and um, this was an event that immediately went uh, public for news media and even for, for the current uh, scientific journals uh, in the days. Bullfinch uh, Amphitheater was the old uh, name of what we today uh, call the Ether Dome. So if you are in Boston, visit. It's a, a nice place to visit. It looks like this, still. Uh, and uh, this is the uh, sort of picture of, of uh, what was going on in the days with all the dignitaries in the faculty. And uh, one of the scientifically oriented or medically oriented uh, papers wrote that, gentlemen, this is no humbug. 
stainless surgical operations using sulfuric um, ether. This information traveled quickly to Scandinavia. And I have learned from uh, a little study of what Ole Seko wrote uh, about first ether anesthetics. And this is quite uh, an extraordinary information. Uh, the 6th of February, the first ether anesthesia was given in uh, Sweden. Uh, the 20th of February, the first ether anesthesia was given in Denmark. And the 4th of March, the first ether anesthesia was given in Norway. And in Finland, March 8, the same year, 1847. Uh, Iceland came a little later, but fairly quickly anyway, considering the, the level of healthcare that was existing in Iceland in, in those days. But within six or eight weeks, first ether anesthesias were given in, in, in four of the five uh, Scandinavian countries. A few thoughts about this. Uh, the discovery of anesthesia was serendipitous at this frolic uh, party, uh, but it remained to find its place in medical practice. But we were entering into a dynamic period uh, of uh, uh, medicine. And uh, to start this period, insensibility to pain had been discovered with, uh, during this time. And uh, the inventions uh, continued. The cocaine story, Albert Niemann described the uh, alkaloid and Carl Koller needed something for his eye surgery. So he asked Sigmund Freud if he could use a little bit of, of Sigmund Freud's cocaine. And uh, it was successful. And Alfred Einhorn did really the first uh, uh, synthetic uh, local anesthetic, uh, the, uh, the uh, ester compound procaine uh, in 1905. So this was a dynamic uh, time. And infiltration uh, anesthesia and local blocks were now frequently used as well. And spinal. I, 1885, and uh, one learned from Henrik uh, Quinke from Kiel that it was safe below L2, L3, and uh, you should use a thin as uh, cannula as possible. So with this as a background, uh, I will now continue to, to use um, uh, development of healthcare of medicine in general and anesthesia and how that went in parallel and, and uh, where anesthesia has been put during these three time periods. Well, we started very uh, uh, early in the 1900s, which was a dynamic uh, time. The late 1800s and the early 1900s saw Louis Pasteur and what he had, uh, had achieved. You also learned a little bit in the light microscope that came in those days about inflammatory cells, which were unknown until uh, this uh, discovery was made. And we had Röntgen, of course, in those days, uh, Robert Koch, tuberculosis and disease transmissions, and uh, Theodor Koch about the thyroid gland physiology, pathology, and surgery of that. Alexis Carroll learned how to widen the vascular uh, uh, geometry so you could transplant uh, and, so, and uh, get the vessels right and uh, no thrombosis. The Leinstein and uh, the blood groups and Bilroth, insulin, 1920s. Penicillin and sulfonamide uh, in the 30s to 40s. So, um, just to show a little bit about what this dynamic time also could, could mean to us anesthesiologists and how we thought in those days and planned. Uh, and uh, it was a neurosurgeon 
uh, called Crayley, who in the first issue of Anesthesia and Analgesia in 1914, described uh, what he called his theory of anosy association. It's pretty clear that if you have a trauma and you're fully awake, you activate your, your uh, brain. If you are anesthetized, you have your trauma, you also activate your brain. A little different, but still, there is activation. So what he thought this early, if you uh, anesthetize and you use a block of some kind, you are well off. This is an information that we, that we uh, really look upon as the stress-free kind of anesthesia. And this is also a very high topic today, how we can activate microglia and how Kevin Tracy and others have discovered the inflammatory reflex, as one say, just like the patella reflex, there is an inflammatory reflex uh, evolving uh, the, the brain. And that came to us fairly early and is still one of the hottest uh, topics uh, today for uh, developing our practice. I'm sure this is a field that will change our practice within the next uh, 15, 20 years, quite a lot. So uh, this was an important part, but there were also three other I will go quickly through them. Intravenous anesthesia, you needed to have an injection needle. That was 1853, dynamic times here. First intravenous was chloral hydrate, uh, 1872. Then came the barbiturates, and that's why I put this slide up from 1930s. And the ultra-short uh, thiopental, first used by John Lundy at Mayo Clinic, 1934, a major step as you are all understand. And the tracheal intubation was also a high topic. Uh, the beginning of 1900, Kuhn's book about the, the peroral intubation. And it was the laryngoscope that brought intubation to anesthesia. It wasn't within our practice before the laryng uh, laryngoscope uh, came. And they came in different uh, periods and uh, shapes, and you all know them very well. Just to make this complete, in the 1940s, although one knew about uh, curare uh, early on, but it was during the 1940s that it combined with Stefan Teslev's uh, uh, succinylcholine and uh, muscle relaxation became something we used fairly frequently. So this period was focus on surgical activities in the operating room. There were no antibiotics, no anti-inflammatory drugs, poor pre and post-op recovery or care. Anesthesia and analgesia was not very highly prioritized in our uh, medical world. And acid base and metabolism and fluid were underdeveloped. So we had a fairly simple uh, organization, medicine to the left of our hospitals and surgery to the right. But when we compared our practice with the practice in the United States and the United Kingdom, the outcome of surgery was uh, very poor in the Scandinavian countries. And I have a couple of examples that I have borrowed from, from the information given by Torsten Gord. Well, he started the first position for anesthesia, physici the first physician position uh, for anesthesia in 1940 when he returned from his uh, two years uh, in Madison, Wisconsin by Ralph uh, Waters. So this is a comparison of, um, well, I should go back, press the wrong buttons here. But this is from the 1920s in uh, Stockholm compared to the first three years of Torsten Gord's practice, uh, cholecystectomies had a mortality of 8.3%, and it came down to 1.4%. Cancer coli, almost 60%. Uh, 
and came down to 15%. Uh, he also compared a local activity, Uppsala and Stockholm, and the two Stockholm hospitals that he organized, a uh, comparison of mortalities of around 12%, uh, or, or even in, in uh, Uppsala in those days. And the first couple of years, it came down to 7% uh, in Stockholm, but remained at 12% in Uppsala. So close. Similar activities. The only difference was that anesthesia was organized and physician-led in, uh, in Stockholm. So this information, wisely uh, done by uh, Torsten Gård, sort of convinced the Scandinavian societies that, uh, or Scandinavian uh, medical world, that this was something one should uh, took serious. So it, uh, it put the requirement into getting organized and to uh, find a navigation compass. And you should navigate, you should teach and train, you should establish a society, you should start a journal, and you should develop your science. So Torsten, he was visited by a lot of uh, colleagues and they asked for the comparison. In those days, you had the anesthesia equipment like this, but everyone who visited Torsten had to sign his guest book. And uh, just look at the first two pages. There was Eero Turpanen and another guy from uh, Finland early on. First page, 1940. Second page, uh, Ernst Trier Möller from uh, Denmark and Copenhagen visited Torsten. And it, it goes on. Interesting book to read <laughs> and to study all these names. It's quite fun. But you can also have fun when you, when you are fairly new. I think I've been chairing uh, the Stockholm uh, department for a couple of years. And Torsten always came, came by and said hello every day. And uh, this day, he said, Sten, I must present a, uh, an old friend of mine. And that was Ernst Trier Mörk, uh, who in the early 1990, uh, 1990s visited Torsten. And they came down and they sat in my, my two sh chairs in my office. And, and they started to talk. And they forgot about me. <laughs> and I could just sit there and listen to these two guys, how they presented themselves. And they had different stories to tell. Torsten uh, had great support from the surgeons at the Karolinska or in the Stockholm region. And uh, Ernst Trier Mörk, he said, well, I have all kinds of problems. Uh, there were no support. And they were chasing me because I had felt that anesthesia is something for me. It's, it's so good. I would like to, to put efforts into it. I would like to, to, uh, to, to help out and, and uh, establish anesthesia in, in Denmark. But he, he, he was sort of knocked out. Uh, or, uh, so he moved. He emigrated to the United States. And... Um, and, and was successful uh, in the States and had great fun in the specialty, was a good, uh, good doctor in those days. And even at this age, these two gentlemen, well, I, I asked the hospital photographer to come, please come and take a couple of pictures. But there are more pictures than this. Uh, but, but you see that this, this uh, gentleman, he, he was successful even in his old days he, were, he had just been appointed sheriff in his local <laughs> county in, in Florida, where he, where he lived. As a, two, two great guys. That perhaps one of those short moments in your life that you will never forget. But they talked about how difficult it was to start anesthesia in our world.
We had a lot of resistance. You needed to be brave, Sigga. And you needed to, to break through. And these two did it. So with that, I will leave this uh, period uh, of the beginning of, of the 1900s and take the, 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 the next uh, 50 years characterized by uh, very much of a new knowledge that appeared. It was also a dynamic time, but dynamic in another way. It developed medicine and focus was now put uh, very much uh, on uh, outcome. And uh, that required improvements in anesthesia, of course, as we have seen the early statistics here. And this is the period uh, when medicine, uh, advancements in medicine were closely connected to the advancements or, of our own speciality, how they went hand in hand, so to speak. And uh, one of the uh, great uh, uh, compass navigations there was to establish uh, anesthesia societies. And they were, uh, in the 1940s to mid-50s, just small groups, small societies, Nordic network from the start. You saw the Nordic names in, in Torsten's uh, guest book. Uh, so that was a connection that would start it already from the beginning. And I will give you just for the credit of important individuals in the five different countries. You may be able to read some of the names there, uh, but they all did pioneering work together with a lot of other individuals to get uh, uh, societies uh, and uh, uh, started. Memberships were first couple of years uh, dominated by surgeons. Nordic, uh, Anesthesiolo Nordisk Anesthesiologisk Forening, NAF, started in 1949 as, as a result of these five uh, societies or uh, groups working together. And the first uh, NAF Congress was in 1950, and the president for that one was uh, Otto Möllestad, and the Congress was held in, in Oslo. So that was the first Congress, but it started in 1949. Establishing of a scientific journal. Well, the NAF Congress in Stockholm, 1952. Then Torsten Gård was the president, and uh, the Scandinavian journal was on the agenda. Henning Paulson uh, had a key role to establish the uh, uh, journal, and he looked into the uh, economics of it. And he, he said, there is no risk, they, they just, just go. I mean, this is <laughs> just, just safe. And there were lovely, uh, lively discussions. But the conclusion was, we have insufficient scientific activities. So we had to wait in 1954, when the NAF Congress was in Copenhagen. Ulle Seko was the president. And uh, Henning Paulson, persistent, no risk, shoot, lively discussions, but science not mature. So it went on till uh, the next NAF Congress, 1956, in Helsinki, and shared by or the president was uh, Eero Topanen. And um, discussions again, Henning Paulson, again, safe, shoot. Discussions in the General Assembly, which were, uh, was established as, as a uh, phrase for us uh, at that time. And this time, the conclusion was to go ahead. So very soon after this, uh, every, first everyone uh, agreed that it was kind of good to take time and to mature and to start uh, at a good uh, pace, but, but then once decision was taken, there was a planning meeting early on already in, in November 1956, and it was decided with the name, the language, and the owner uh, of the journal, and the finances that should be separate from uh, the NAF. Uh, first ACTA board, Eric Nilsson, 
Henning Paulsson, Jörn Ibsen and Ulle Secker, uh, Torpen and Eva Lund and Ulle Friberg were the um, uh, was the editorial board and this is Nilla the, um, the guy from from the University of Lund. Volume one appeared in the fall of 1957 but it was soon felt that the, the dynamic uh, number of subscribers uh, needed uh, the journal to increase its volume uh, and its size. So this was really a success. You see, in, in a couple of years' time, there was a fantastic development of uh, uh, the number of subscribers of our uh, journal uh, in those days. There was also a dynamic development of our practice. We saw new intravenous drugs appear during this period, new inhalational agents, stronger analgesics, improved local anesthetics, new muscle relaxants, modern anxiolytics. My world, and pretty much your world, if I look <laughs> out to the audience, uh, to follow all these uh, inventions and uh, new things, uh, nitrous oxide almost disappeared in the end. Um, and uh, valuable new handy monitors were developed of great importance uh, for us. Uh, and uh, we also continued to uh, improve uh, the equipment. You see the anesthesia working stations uh, delivering all the gases. Just compare with the old ones where you see on the, <laughs> on the uh, right hand side the reverted vacuum cleaner uh, <laughs> to uh, use as, as a, uh, a ventilator and compared to, to the machines that uh, developed uh, during the 1950s to the 2000s. So that was a dynamic uh, time, of course. Patient safety was already on. We've seen these monitors that helped very much in patient safety, new techniques for laryngoscopes and, and so on uh, were developed and uh, patient evaluations pre and post-op were uh, developed and uh, which also improved uh, patient safety. Beecher was driving these issues from the very first beginning. I wonder about the statistics, but in his report together with Todd in 1952, the mortality claimed that anesthesia had something to do with it was 1 to 1,500. That was probably not right uh, in the days because patients are sick and die from many causes. But there was another from the United Kingdom uh, 30 years later that showed uh, numbers that we, we more think are reliable for today. So anesthesia is safe and it is a, uh, and the development to this stage is fantastic during these uh, uh, years. Continued opioids, endorphins, gait theory, pain clinics came up. Development of uh, intensive care, one started during these 50 years to, to more go to the pathogenic mechanisms for why people are in the ICUs or why people are sick. And, and that created a fantastic development of intensive care uh, that had to be based on uh, pathogenic processes and advanced knowledge of, of disease mechanisms and, and uh, so on. So that early on uh, triggered uh, development of acid base and fluid, nutrition, uh, infection, ventilation, uh, organization and not least important for what we are going to turn into for the SSAI to come, education. We need it to be very good. We needed to know what we were doing, not only maintain the airways and the intravenous lines. So modern uh, intensive care and f following along, 
during this time also the acute medicine emergency care, which also is very strong uh, in our society. Teaching and training is important. Uh, and uh, we formed our uh, uh, specialist educations uh, during the 50s and 60s and uh, I think all Scandinavian countries in the 60s and early 70s had five years of training as a requirement. Subspecialization started to develop. National society designed fine programs, international activities of importance, but it was difficult for each uh, society to match the quality from Europe and the United States. This was a field where the Nordic countries together could develop and collaborate. NAF did, however, not offer such activities. Medical development continued and we, as we went along uh, to the end of the 1900s, uh, we, uh, we had gone very far in the organ-based structures of our uh, activities. We have the neuro, we have the cardiac, we have the peds, uh, we have the ortho, and it goes on, obstetrics, you already, well, you see what I have listed here. And they all came into depth in each of these specialties, which was important for us to learn more about the collaborating work we had to do with these specialties. Intensive care developed strong in PEDS, neuro, cardiac, and general intensive care. It was kind of a dispersity. It, it, we thought that, that this is something that we need to look into. This is something we need to, to be able to control and find our specialties place to work uh, with these different uh, organ-based uh, specialities. Pain clinics, the same. Emergency medicine was a little different, but was also established uh, at this time. So if we had medicine to the left and surgery to the right, early on, we now have 50, 60, 70 different specialties in the end of the 1900s. Uh, uh, so, um, entirety became a, uh, an issue of importance. Uh, or should we uh, go for fragmentation? Should we uh, split up and forget about anesthesia as a main subject. Those were the discussions that emerged from the way medicine developed in the 1900s. Just a little uh, cartoon about this. If the, uh, the central part here is our specialty, we worked the neuro and uh, cardiac and peds and all, uh, all over the place. And, uh, and the central part uh, was really what we call the speciality, where the textbook is, the subject, where the knowledge is to be found for us in our specialty, although we work at different uh, places. And uh, we had the activities out there. So this was a challenge. Its entirety a possible way to go were questions in the early 1990s that we really asked ourselves, is it wise to keep together? And um, if activity is horizontal, I present this uh, hor uh, horizontal picture for a later uh, picture to come, or a slide to come, then specialities would be on the vertical uh, axis of our hospital care, so to speak, the horizontal and the vertical, arose as some kind of organizational discussions uh, in our different uh, hospitals. 
Naf did not satisfy entirety. Naf was too thin and narrow in, uh, in its activities and uh, had lost touch with the latest development uh, of medicine. That was discussed in Reykjavik 1995, Stockholm 1997, and finally in Aarhus 1999. And this is what, what I now will uh, use my, my last, I think we are doing fine on time, <laughs> although a lot of slides here, but, but uh, this is the background for uh, what, what uh, was needed to do in order to uh, attract uh, the speciality, the young ones coming into our specialty, what was there to offer, what was there to give in terms of knowledge and knowledge-based activities. So at the meeting in uh, Reykjavik, 1995, the president, uh, Vigdis Fimbogadotto, is, is standing in the middle here. I think that is Torsten Gård, and you can see a lot of other uh, dim uh, faces here. But um, uh, uh, this was the meeting when a, where a fact-finding questionnaire was presented about these things. We wanted to ask the community, what do you want? And the person who was responsible for this was Eja Nilsson. Uh, from Finland. And um, the questionnaire was motivated in several ways. NAF had developed into a congress organization, no activities between the biannual meetings, financially weak, risky to take responsibilities and arrange congresses. Each country was independent, no common economy, Attendance in decline, old club, you know the phrases. <laughs> no connection to modern requirements. No added value in terms of clinical practice, education and development. How to address several modern challenges was not on the uh, program. So reasons to carry on and continue as usual with the NAF were few or almost none. So uh, this is the board of NAF uh, at that time. And uh, Eja Nilsson is sitting in the front row there. And um, most important decisions at the Reykjavik Congress were to take home the results of AR's questionnaire and discuss it nationally. Uh, establish the ACTA Foundation. Important individuals there is, of course, Eva Heide Götken, but also Sven Erik Giswold and Martin Brinkler. A nice triad of uh, strong people, brave people. Uh, that uh, took early decisions uh, for the ACTA Foundation. We will come back to that in a little moment. And uh, the next was to continue discussions in the board. And there I put a circle around Torstein Stefansson from Iceland, who was the Congress president in Reykjavik, but then continued as general secretary uh, in the organization. And this was the incoming president which is supposed to be me. So we had to continue this discussion a little bit and present the final decision at the NAF Congress in Stockholm, 1997. The working group for modernization of NAF is this one. You can recognize quite a few of these people active still here, results and suggestions based on discussions concerning a reorganization to be presented at the NAF Congress in Stockholm, 97. So, um, 
just to, to illustrate the urgency of the changes. You know, the thread mills in the fitness center, press quick start. And this was really what uh, Eva Goethe did. He pressed the quick, uh, the quick start. ACTA Foundation was established 1995. Same year and summer as the Reykjavik meeting. ACTA Foundation will secure the economical basis for publication of ACTA, and it should be based in Danish legislation, including uh, taxation and uh, auditing business. The objects of the foundation were to promote the scientific development of anesthesiology in the Scandinavian countries, all five, support collaboration between Scandinavian anesthesiologists, publish ACTA. Creation of the NAF Foundation was the first important step on the road towards reorganization of NAF. ACTA Foundation is financially separated from NAF later the SSLI. The combined board and planning meeting took place during two days um, in 1996 uh, in Kelvin, just outside of Copenhagen. This is uh, still the hotel, I guess. It was an important catalogue of meetings uh, we had and in-depth discussions regarding the NAF engagement for specialist education, continued medical education, research, quality, safety, inter-Nordic collaboration. All these issues were up again and again and again, just to make sure that everyone understood. Develop a clear structure, but time was not ready for a federal organization. We couldn't leave the links to the Scandinavian, uh, to our national uh, societies, and go broadly together, uh, financially at least, which was very important. Continued discussion present in Stockholm and important discussions and debates within each national society was carried out um, based on, on uh, the Hellroth uh, meeting and interactions between NAF board, the planning group and national societies. All three interacted frequently, helped clarify and look ahead, and look ahead together, not separate. The NAF Congress in Stockholm then, uh, no other team, NAF board and the planning group presented. The General Assembly discussed and debated. And this was kind of a, uh, a theory or philosophy that uh, carried the idea of a uh, communality between the five different uh, Nordic countries and um, together made uh, stronger. The best way to honor history was to, uh, to modernize and modify in concert with the changes in modern medicine development and expansion of uh, knowledge. So the conclusions were reorganize, start the process, prepare for transition in Aarhus 1999. Design an organization that was good for the tripartite mission of clinical practice, education and training, and research and innovation. Excellence in all three is needed. So, um, press quick start again after the, <laughs> the Stockholm meeting. Uh, implementations uh, were started fairly early on and enhanced knowledge is the key to influence. Without knowledge, if we are going to be leaders in intensive care, world, which was the quick start, we needed to be those who had the best knowledge 
we could just not only say that we are anesthesiologists, we are intensivists. We need to know. There's no other way to a leading position. So several times seminars and discussions uh, took part uh, immediately after the Stockholm meeting. And we met at Schäfergården several times. <laughs> and um, those meetings were good. It was uh, hard work, full day's work. And uh, the board decided to start two-year programs in intensive care medicine. The first program started already in 1998. This is to say before SSAI existed. And the second uh, uh, started in 1999, also before I, I think the uh, SSAI uh, was up. The NAF Congress in 1999 was the Congress when things happened. The time from NAF Stockholm 97 was well spent and uh, there were open discussions in the uh, uh, societies. And um, this was the uh, brochure. This was the Congress president, next speaker, Elsie Tönnesen. And I chose this picture because it also took on Bjorn Ibsen. Another token of modernizing things was that this Bjorn is probably the, the last one who became an honorary member of our society because yes, we would have to leave the old club, so to speak, and not I mean, uh, development of our specialty. The pioneers were gone, so to speak, and we, we couldn't honor everything. Good things happen in so many places. So this would be a sort of a, a funny thing. So I think, Elsa, this is the, <laughs> the last uh, someone, uh, last occasion when someone was made an honorary member of, of the NAF, which still existed uh, when this picture was taken. The General Assembly in Aarhus decided 50 years after the start of NAF to accept and implement the various suggestions to change. Uh, a booklet came out, looked like this. Hard work to get it done because you have to weigh every word that was uh, in it. I had, uh, as the, the first president then of the SSAI, to uh, write about the introduction and vision. Torsten Stefansson about the organizational structure. Quality Assurance Subcommittee, which is today's Clinical Practice Committee by Jaco Jalnen, and Educational Subcommittee, Hans Floten, Hans is probably here somewhere, and the ACTA Subcommittee, Sven Erik, uh, was, was dealing with the research-oriented uh, issues. And of course, financial matters, Eva Goetke came back again, very important. And, um, financial matters for the SSAI, which was the, the new organization with a common economy uh, representing the whole SSAI, that is to say the federation, because the federation was now accepted. But this was important. And articles. This is to be found in this little booklet. Uh, goals were set by these committees. Look at the quality uh, clinical practice committee. The first two years, this is what you should achieve. Started immediately again. I should have written quick start. It all happened. Education started very early on. Prepare application form. Start ICU program three. Pain program started. Nordic CME. Other programs started, promote learning and advanced leaderships and seminars, and uh, ACTA and research, improve scientific writing, statistics, study designs, and all these good things happened immediately. And the goals continued, uh, promote science and development, uh, the ACTA Foundation, support collaboration, publish ACTA, financial matters, Morton, 
economic foundation, the life nerve of positive growth and development. Without a sound economy, uh, you cannot do things. Aims cannot be attained. Activities cannot be arranged if we didn't have the necessary uh, money. So the millennium could now be met in an organization designed for the future, an organization designed to support the continued change in order for our specialty to always be aligned with and actively contributing to the development of modern academic health care. To find the right time to change is important, but it's also important to always doubt your suggestions before you carry out and develop. Some thoughts about uh, trends, new trends, three revolutions, just to finish up now. I think we are still doing okay with time. I think we had the molecular biology, we had the genomics, we had the uh, convergence revolution, which we are just now living in, because things have expanded. We need to converge our activities. Convergence, revolution, and technological advances set the stage. Technological innovations, fusing neuroscience and biomedical engineering, have a computer finding the signals from the brain to drive the hand. New knowledge, knowledge transfer, transforming healthcare are important ingredients in modern academic society to support the tripartite mission. Perhaps pathogenic themes will support the tripartite mission. These are some of them. Look at inflammation, for instance. If this is a theme to build hospital organizations, you have multiple sclerosis people to deal with inflammation, to work with Crohn's disease or rheumatoid arthritis or psoriasis or other inflammatory diseases of importance. So um, a clinician who would like to work with the inflammation met an educationalist to like to teach about the inflammation, who met a researcher who liked to do research on inflammation. That is what a theme is. So if themes are horizontal, specialities are vertical. And uh, does SSAI fulfill its task today? Let me talk briefly about uh, these four things. Um, the society structure, the federation format is supported. Uh, this year's Congress in collaboration with the Swedish Society. Well attended biennial Congresses. We have a high participation number at the current Congress. Active program between the Congresses. Look at all these courses that are already ongoing. Financially robust. Economical backup if needed. ACTA Foundation again, surplus invested. These are the money, sound, safe economy. Nordic interactions improved, internationally well respected. The journal, subscribers increased 10,000, 5,000 Scandinavians and 5,000 non-Scandinavians. Impact factors increasing. Well done. Keep up, Michael. <laughs> Clinical practice, strategy, continued focus on guidelines, quality, safety, sharing responsibilities, educational programs, cardiac, critical emergency medicine, intensive care. Started 1998 as we had two-year programs, five courses, exchange was needed so we should work together in our different in, uh, ICUs. That was an important part. The 17th program is about to start, 2015, 
you need the uh, European diploma, part one, to be able to be accepted for our intensive care courses for this program. That is development and expansion. Most ICUs in the Scandinavian countries are led by people who have been through these programs. Pediatric, also very ambitious, and pain, perioperative medicine, obstetrics, and not least, let us train the trainers so we have good teachers. Research committee, grant seminars, writing projects, work together, clinical multicenter studies. And next uh, slide is perhaps the last one, or a couple of others. A new hospital, it happens to be the Karolinska, which is very expensive, too expensive <laughs> today. But healthcare, clinical practice, is built together with education and research. There are no borders between these activities. So if themes now occur per floor, they are the horizontal ones. And our specialties had to work uh, uh, on the vertical axis. And our specialty will do well for whatever structure comes up if we base our activities on um, a new knowledge and knowledge transfer. That is the best guarantee for a safe um, future. So um, the elegant new logo and careful amendments of the articles for SSAI symbolizes innovation and creativity and is a robust token of belief in the future. Thanks to all leaders in the SSAI organization for your fine work, and not least to all members and to sponsors and supporters. SSAI is well set to meet the future. So this is the time for the first president to take off his hat and salute the continued development of SSAI. So well structured and positioned to accommodate future changes and challenges. No rest, continued change, go on. On a personal note, when you have been so actively involved in a reorganization and you leave, you are a little concerned, you are a little sort of you wonder a little bit, what's going to happen? How are things going to develop? So real satisfaction and happiness for a former leader of an organization, of a department or a section is when you can conclude that the work functions better than when you left. So today, this is a real satisfied individual and he is happy. Thank you.